Hi, Misha here, and this is uh, another $5 Patreon requested video from Matt P. Matt P. Matt, Matt P. And also, you're witnessing a guinea pig test of a new camera we picked up to see how it works, so we don't have the headphone adapter for it yet because nothing is easy anymore. So, if the audio is a little eh, I apologize for that. Anyway, onto the video on all these guns. He asked to kind of compare and contrast the various service guns of the major powers in the First World War, the Great War, and then for both Jay and I to kind of pick our favorite, or favorites maybe. So this first part you'll have me, and then Jay will hop in at the end. <clears throat> so kind of just laid them out here, kind of the major ones, certainly not every. Here we have the... C96 broom handle, and this is a red 9, which was the 9mm version used by Germany. Here we have the famous German gun, the P08 Luger. This is a World War I production, also still a 9mm. And the Luger was standard, the uh, Red 9 was substitute standard, and they also had a number of little 32 caliber 7.65 Browning pistols. And so just to represent those, I brought out my Walther Model 4. This was made specifically for the German military. It got a longer barrel, longer snout, and a longer grip with a slightly higher mag capacity but they used others mausers and the like and i could have grabbed those but we have enough on the table so operations just for comparison you know the uh mauser system here is a rear toggle clip fed fixed magazine originally these were in seven point six three thirty caliber mauser but for the Germans, they for the military, they did the 9. This is actually an original gun that was reworked after the war, so it has a shortened barrel. Originally, it would have been a 5.5, and, and it had the adjustable sight removed and replaced with a fixed sight, so excuse those differences. Of course, it was also slotted for stock. These were a very early self-loader, so you kind of have to forgive them some of their oddities. The Luger two, as you know, uses this unique toggle system. Forgive me if I don't like dry firing the guns like these, but you know how the Lugers work. They're very famous for their ergonomics. Single action trigger. Manual safety here. And this was standard, obviously, during before, during, and after World War I. And little Walthers like this, little 32s, are gonna be blowback only. Although they did attempt the 9mm version, the Model 6. No last round hold open, although it does have a manual hold open. Pretty simple, straightforward. So these are the German guns. Now they work. Moving right along. These are actually ones that people often forget. The guns of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and there were several. This is the... Rast Gasser Revolver. Pretty standard. It is a double single action. One interesting feature, it has a firing pin mounted in the frame, not on the hammer. Pretty forward thinking. It also has a very unique grip angle. And quite a large capacity. I'm going to point this at you. Don't worry, it's not loaded because good luck even finding ammo for these. But you can see how many cylinders it has. There was also, of course, guns like the Frommer Stop and the Roth Krinka, Roth Steyr, but really the major cutting edge gun for Austria at the time was uh, this here often known as the Steyr Hahn. It's more accurately the model 1911 or 1912. Unique system. 
uses a rotating barrel. It is also clip fed, like the broom handle with a fixed magazine. They did this for a number of reasons. It is single action only. Very tough, dependable pistol. And these would serve in different forms through World War II even. Moving right on down to Italy, we have the 1889 Bodio, and I decided to bring the enlisted model out because it has this cool trigger. Comes down for single action mode. It is double action too, but the idea with the trigger is it pretty much acts as a safety because, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a pretty old school style loading gate revolver. I can do it. But, uh, yeah. This one's a little finicky. But it, it's a neat gun, and we've done a couple of videos. This does lock up. These are very much still in service in World War One. Even though they started off as black powder, they would transition to smokeless. One of the earliest adopted automatics in Italy was the Glycinti here. This is the model 1910. It is often thought of as a Luger. It even fires 9x19, but it's Glycinti, a weaker round. It has a rear charging action with a wedge system. Again, these are pretty delicate. So I'm not going to do that. Pretty, pretty standard though. Interestingly, it has a grip safety in the front, not the back. <laughs> it has a lot of interesting, neat features. And then, also a 9 Glycinti, we have the Beretta 1915, Beretta's first handgun. What's interesting about this, it is a <coughs> blowback only, even though it fires 9mm, but it is 9mm Glycinti. So you can kind of get away with that. And it holds open on the mag, so when you pull the mag out, it goes forward. Another odd feature, it has a safety here. And a second safety back here. Because, I don't know, why not? <sighs> yeah, Italy. But it does have the characteristic Beretta open top slide even back then. And these were pretty small number guns, and they used a lot of 32s as well. But that kind of shows you that side of things. Moving to our second room. Of course, we have the British Webley and Scott. I decided to pick the Mark VI, which is the wartime version. Top break. 455 Webley. The... Mark VI had a longer snout and a more squared off grip, and it had hard rubber, vulcanized rubber, if you will, stocks. It was double action, single action, for your additional firing pin there. Very classic gun, and the British never really went in much for automatics in World War I. Heck, not even a whole lot in World War II. Ditto for the Russians here, and this is a Nagant, you're pretty familiar with. 7.62 Nagant. Double, single action. The biggest claim to fame is how the cylinder moves forward to make a gas seal with this gun. Otherwise, it's very traditional loading gate. You know the Nagant, and you love the trigger. Moving right along to France, they too had a revolver. This is the 1892, often known as the Labelle, although it's not. Firing 8mm, much like the rest. It's your typical double single action, although it does have a uh, 
swinging out the cylinder here. You can tell I haven't operated these in a while. Everything's a little stiff. Very stiff spring on this one still. And that was actually kind of unique for its day and time. There weren't a lot of guns like that in military service. And uh, that was the standard, although France had a whole host of 32s, much like Germany. There was, of course, the Savage, but I decided to bring out a Ruby here, made in Spain, sometimes known as the Model 1914. This is a Spanish copy of a Browning S design, but simplified. And there are all kinds of variations of these. And these were very much a cottage industry type gun, single action only. Yeah, again, France had a lot of little 32s in the war. And even though you're not in Europe, I could not ignore Japan. This is their Type 26 revolver. This is double action only, and it too is a top break, firing 9mm. Checkered grips, blued finish. It borrows from several other guns. While they only made well, fewer than 60,000 of these, these all served very much through World War II and were the standard in World War I. However, Japan, especially the Navy, was starting to go to automatics with the Type 4 here, or the Nambu Model 1902, or the Papa Nambu. This is the first to fire 8mm Nambu. It too is a rear cocking system. The early versions like this only had the one spring. They were in limited service in World War I, but enough of them were made that they were still used in World War II, and this directly led to the Type 14 you're familiar with. And then, of course, we started with Germany, ending with America. This is the 1917 revolver. Notice its cylinder swings to the left, whereas the French went to the right. This is in 45 ACP, Colt's large frame. As you know, there was also a Smith & Wesson version. And those were there to substitute when they could not get these. Colt, model 1911, also in 45 ACP. This is a 1918 model. You know it, you love it. Browning's very famous tilting, tipping barrel. Linked locking system. All that good stuff. And America too had some 32s, like the Colt 1903. America didn't rely as heavily on 32s as some of the others. So, what do we uh, what do we think of these, and kind of how do we loosely rank them? Well, let's get to that. And now Jay will join me for more of a subjective talk about these. Uh, again, I know that was a very much an overview, but you saw a lot of just in that. But we do have videos on pretty much all of these in detail. Yep. So, what do you think? Um, what, what are your thoughts before you just say favorites? Yeah, so the one directly in front of you, which I believe is the Austrian, the, that uh, one right there? Yeah, this is the, we'll call it the Steyrhahn. That's kind of its colloquial name. Um, is it? This is my favorite period for handguns. And the reason is, is something that I learned whenever I went up to the first time the World War I Museum in Kansas City is it seems like just about every country were making their own handgun designs, whether it was revolver or semi-auto or what have you. And so all of these guns are very unique. Like very few of these guns look 
similar to another one. <laughs> so this is my favorite era of handguns just because there are so many different out there designs. So as far as looks, the Steyr Han is my favorite looking gun out of all of these on the table. Um, if I were going to give it, if we're just going purely for appearances sake, like I think that one looks really cool. It's kind of futuristic -y looking in a retro way. Um, and then of course the, the Luger is also a classic. So from a, from an appearance what, what, standpoint, what would you say for like. a revolver? You've been on a revolver kick lately. Yeah, I, I have to give it to the Webley. Um, yeah. <laughs> the Webley is just, it's too much of a classic and I, I like the operation on it. They, they were known to be pretty decent firearms as well. So from a usability standpoint for revolvers, I would say the Webley. Um, so from a, we'll say, say from an aesthetic appearance, which one do you think that you prefer? I think on the revolver side of things, I think mechanically, I think the Ras Gasser is neat and forward yeah. thinking in a lot of ways, not in the cylinder, but I love the uh, firing pin in the frame, the higher capacity, the yeah. not cowboy style grip. But of course it has the old school cylinder. I really do like the Japanese Type 26. It's small, light. This was really what the gun was kind of going to, a very much a defensive gun. So if you're going to do a revolver, something like this works well. And this is kind of what Britain ended up going to with World War II when they went to the 30, 38, 238 s and w gun so they even went to the yep. double action only of course i didn't even bring it out but there's always the the reichs revolver from mm -hmm. germany that's a hoot so yeah but as far as actual mechanics and functioning i really like the webley it's classic i'd love to give it to the webley but i have to say the 1917 here is uh it's a solid gun, 45 ACP for, performs very well out of it. It's just a classic. It's just, it's so well built that they hold up to this day over 100 years later. Yeah. Webleys, because they're top brakes, maybe not so much. Plus a lot of them have been bored out into 455. Yeah, part of the reason why I like it is because it's a top brake. Oh yeah, they're, they're neat. As far as automatics, aesthetically, the Glycenti? No, it's it is weird. I'll give that. It gets weird points, mm -hmm. it, and in, internally, it's just as weird as the others. Um, this little Walther here, the Model Four, has a lot of sentimental value to me, so it's worth a lot there. And it's a good, simple military gun. Um, but I'd I'd really have to say. It's just, it's hard to top a, a Luger. It really mm. is. And it was one of the most successful, really the most successful early designs. And it gets a lot of flack for jamming in the trenches. That seems to be 80% bullshit, 10% not the gun's fault. So only a, a little bit, because it's a very sealed up gun. It does have a, a bit of an exposed sear, yeah. but it's pretty tightly fitted, so if dirt got in here, it could gum it up. But the problem is, how you got to get it in there. Yeah. Whereas the 1911 took the opposite of approach of more loose tolerances, just to let any dirt that got in fall out. And that's really to be said with any of these 32s and why 32s were so popular. They they're so dirt simple. It's just a a spring with a weight. There's so little to go wrong, and even if it does jam, so easy to clear. So. That, they're kind of the unsung heroes of the trenches, or all the 32s that, that people use. Sure. As far as functionally, um, I, the 1911. I know that's a boring answer, <laughs> but it is the most long-lived of the guns, all the guns on the table. Mm -hmm. um, they're still perfectly acceptable defensive firearms, competition firearms today. And... Um, Having, I have a lot of trigger time experience with 1911s, especially the the older retro style with the lower or with the um, the higher wall, and um, I, I I think this would be my go-to if I had to pick any of these on the table, um, even concurrently with ammo not being you know potentially an issue or anything like that, um, just from purely from a 
throwing 45s, semi-auto reliability, decent trigger, you know, serviceable sights. It's that would be the one that I would. And I would point out you about sights, but even when they went to the A1, the changes weren't internal. Yeah. They weren't mechanical. Right. They were improvements, but they were cosmetic. You know, a new back strap, a new uh, grip safety, sure. a new set of sights, but. It shows you that the, the principle, but America took a lot of time in developing that gun. You right. went through a lot of iterations yeah. to get it right. Not the heart, still pretty much the same gun. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think I think that kind of answers your question, uh, Matt, Hope, hopefully. Certainly an overview. Again, there are others I could have brought out, but I think this gives a pretty, uh, pretty wide range of the major combatants. Of course, you have lots of countries like Sweden that used a variant of the Nagant. Uh, Switzerland used a variant of the Luger, uh, plus their own revolver. You have a lot of old revolvers that are still in service. Um, but yeah, it's a mix of mag fed and it's a mix of uh, stripper clip fed, where yep. that was still a thing. And some countries like Russia and Britain hung on to their revolvers well into World War II. Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, like I said, there's a lot of really interesting designs coming out of that era before mm -hmm. everything kind of became very homogenized. I would say the so, last major design to really come from military would be the, the P-38, because, of course, that led to the Beretta, which they sure. had But, I mean, the, the 1911 really informed the high power, which itself is pretty much the basis for all the modern guns you see today sure and even a few of the oddballs like the beretta px4 uh, you you see rotating barrels like with this steyr han way back then and it wasn't the only one the, the savage 1907 had it so most of the mechanical systems were in place even that far back right yeah there was a gun not too long ago that came out that um they were talking about how revolutionary it was and it was basically the fromer stop yeah um, system so yeah basically a blow forward type design yeah I remember that yeah it has advantages it has disadvantages having a balanced spring system but sure yeah yeah well we do apologize for the five dollar patreons being slow but I think everyone understands the whole way 2020's been so we're knocking a few of them out if um, if you would like to request a video we won't We'll do our best not to half-ass it, no promises, but we'll try like this. So we'd rather wait and take our time and, and do them right. But yeah, uh, check out a link to our Patreon page, a dollar and up, you can ask questions. Five bucks and up, you can request a video. Ten bucks and up, we can basically be your bitch. Anyway, um, with that said, this is Misha. This is Jay. And we'll catch you very soon next time. See ya.